All right, everyone. We are we're three minutes past the hour, so I, I think it's a good time to, to get started. Uh, we uh, I want to thank uh, everyone who is uh, signing in now and and uh, attending this. Um, I first of all, what I'd like to do is just a few housekeeping um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, uh, please keep your microphone turned off. Uh, if you do have questions, you can submit them in the chat box uh, to the organizers. I will see them, uh, and then during the the question uh, period, I will uh, I will ask you to ask them, or or if you'd prefer, I can ask them uh, myself. And um, we're recording uh, the webinar, and it'll be shared with uh, with you afterwards. So with that, uh, let's uh, let's uh, get started, and I'll do a bit of an introduction here. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. So I'm John Evans. I'm the uh, one of the co-founders and the managing director of, of Tractus Asia. I'll be moderating today. Uh, it's extremely exciting to have such a, a distinguished group of uh, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, presenters, and experts uh, on this panel. And today we're going to be talking about uh, global manufacturing footprints, uh, global supply chains, and uh, the, uh, the risk that we're seeing uh, from COVID-19 and, and other issues. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, these four gentlemen have uh, decided to, uh, to join the panel today. I'm gonna do a quick, a short introduction of each one. Uh, Dwight Nordstrom is the chairman of PRI. Dwight is a private equity investor who has invested in more than 20 operations in China. They also have a, a very successful uh, PRI consulting company uh, that helps companies and assists them with their China strategies. Uh, the second speaker uh, will be uh, Dennis Mezerol. Dennis is another co-founder and my business partner at Tractus. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to Dennis, you talking about uh, supply chains and how they're moving around the region. Karan Singhal is uh, the managing director uh, and CEO of Technova, an Indian-based consulting firm that has been in existence for more than 30 years. They've advised thousands of companies on their India strategy, and I'm looking forward to Karan's take on where India is in the global economy and how it fits in with global supply chains. And then finally, a fellow uh, Minnesotan and uh, long-term friend, uh, Bob Hess. Uh, Bob uh, taught me everything I know about uh, supply chain back many years ago when uh, we were colleagues together, uh, longer than I'd care to admit, and he is the cha vice chairman of, of Newmark uh, strategy consulting practice uh, in the United States. And Bob is a fantastic practitioner of site selection and global strategies. So with that, uh, I'm gonna get us started off and Dwight, uh, you're on. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. We have three topics we're gonna try and cover here in seven minutes. So appreciate you dealing with the speed here. Uh, I come not just as uh, chairman of PRI, we have had over 25 equities in China, mostly manufacturing uh, in B2B, medical, aerospace parts, automobile parts. Uh, I'm in also my 17th year as chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce China, uh, the Manufacturing and Sourcing Forum, and, and that group has hundreds of US companies. So I will try and give you inductive examples as we talk about what's going on in manufacturing in China. First off, understand China and manufacturing. If you look at the total world, somewhere between 25 to 30 percent, the numbers vary one or two percent uh, of manufacturing in the world is done in China. And so even small changes in that percentage are massive in terms of its impact in other countries and are they able to absorb what's going on. In our nine op current operations in China, uh, COVID-19 did shut down the operations. Uh, for a while after the Lunar New Year, which started early this year. Uh, but by February 12th, my first operation got restarted. Uh, my last operation in the engineering center was at 100% capacity by the first week of March. So all of our people, let's say about 1,000 people, were able to return to their operations and work. Supply chains, we had some interruptions, but we're at full capacity by also early March. So for China, manufacturing supply chains have 
pretty much rebounded to what they were before COVID-19, with the exception of orders going to the West are in some of our industries down. Other industries are up. Uh, we, we make uh, 300,000 shower doors at one of our factory, and that business is up uh, over 15% uh, here in the February through, uh, through April timeframe. Uh, so the manufacturing chains have rebounded. Uh, we have found pricing discounts being given by some of our key suppliers because some of their other businesses have uh, had challenges. The RMB has slightly depreciated. So uh, it's not a bad time to relook at your pricing negotiations with hungry suppliers that are having challenges. Now, having said that, our auto parts business is way down. That's both because of new cars are having challenges and people simply are driving less for the repair market. So it depends industry by industry, but in general, supply chains have rebounded. We had a couple weeks where logistics were an issue, uh, both with uh, ocean freight. We don't do as much air freight. We try to get away from that. When we have air freighted, we've seen cost increases of over 2.5 times what they were fourth quarter uh, of, of, of 2019 and also difficult to schedule. So if you're dealing in PPEs or related, expect challenges. Uh, we've had lots of companies go to our consulting group of 35 people and ask for on-site inspections, the lack of international travel. So if you're looking to try and, uh, and you should be checking on the quality of products, uh, you're gonna probably have to outsource this because you cannot get people into China. Right now it's a 14 day quarantine time period and, and, and some issues. Uh, second point, the rupture of US-China relationships there's no way, I think the, the message it has to be told right now pretty clearly is from the quantitative analysis, the phase one deal between China and the US, which gave us a respite from uh, the import duties into the US and Ch China had almost for all US products had countered that with a countervailing uh, import duty uh, compared to other sources of the world. Uh, the phase one deal, cannot be reached. It's simply so far behind in terms of amounts of purchases by China of US made products and, and, and grains, et cetera, that uh, it's either gonna have to just be recognized we can't meet this and there's force majeure or else we're gonna have, uh, uh, frankly, with the presidential year and what Xi Jinping is doing. And I think if somebody asked me, well, who moved the cheese more? I actually think Xi Jinping moved the cheese more in some of his policies and, and sort of wolf diplomacy. Uh, it doesn't look good. And so uh, the US and China government to government relationships, I think will get worse uh, in the weeks, months, and probably uh, until sometime in 2021 at the earliest. So uh, expect challenges. Expect the continued decoupling, expect import duties issues not to go away and potentially half that were the December 2019 deal that allowed us to not have the half of the US products of China products imported to US to have any import duties that may get resurrected and, and, and that's gonna be a, a big hit. Uh, so that should be factored into as a risk factor. So in the decoupling, if you want to sell in China or it's associated uh, friendly countries, I think you need a manufacturing base there. But if you're looking just at the US, uh, manufacturing in China faces a lot of risk going forward and they need to be calculated um, in terms of all your whole production scheduling, what products you make where, et cetera. In terms of the status of US private equity investments, uh, again, uh, we are a family fund. Uh, even though in my time, most of my time, my last 30 plus years I've lived and worked in China, I've been a general manager now of seven factories in China. Uh, it was until uh, I would say late 2019 when we would uh, work with other US private equity groups, the valuations from a PE ratio, again, that's just one of many ways to do valuations, uh, were actually higher for the China portions of EBITDA than what were for the US. So in general, it was a positive thing for a US company, a US privately owned company to sell in the private markets that if they had a China piece of the business, the PE ratio was actually higher 
than the U.S. side, typically 0.5 to maybe a, a, a two points increase in that, which is significant in your final purchase price. However, today uh, we're seeing, uh, first of all, there's just simply not enough data. The market has just collapsed. Uh, private equity relies typically upon a lot of debt financing, different stages, different types of debt financing from your 4% interest to 10% or more. And getting that financing today is very, very difficult. So I, when I say what is the status, I wanted to say, first of all, it's tough to get a deal done today. So just recognizing, having said that, um, uh, what we're finding is because due diligence cannot be done in person uh, with U.S. private equity is going to look at the China operations, uh, there's just been delays, there's been discounts, there have been clauses and contracts that uh, you would not typically have seen because uh, most things you want to, you know, do a nice clean uh, bill of sale, et cetera. So uh, it can be done. I think you want to look for different alternatives. One away if a Chinese buyer wants to be involved, unless you're really under extreme duress because they're not going to be able to get their money out of China in a in a in a reasonable time period. And frankly, they're probably just looking for either uh, they're doing catfish hunting, looking for a bottom side deal, or uh, they're just looking to get information. And and so I would be extremely cautious of that in in in, in this world, um, and could give examples of that. So thanks for listening, Dennis. Curse. The a Chinese curse that uh, the Dwight uh, probably knows about, and it's. It's, uh, it's called, May You Live in Interesting Times. Um, and that's supposed to be a blessing, but uh, typically used quite ironically. Um, and it's certainly ironic in, in many ways, describing the, the times that we live in, and certainly over the last few months. And I, I, know, I know I'm one uh, that could use for a little bit of boredom at this point. Um, based on what we've seen, you know, companies have, over the last 25 years since we've been doing location and investment strategy work in Asia, companies have been, uh, investment decisions that have been made have been historically made for internal reasons. Companies are focused on acquiring new, new resources, entering new, uh, entering new markets, seeking to improve efficiency, uh, searching for lower cost locations or specialized workforces. External factors like trade policy, incentives, regulations and such, concerns about natural disaster risks and, and other risks have been important in the location decision, but we certainly haven't seen them driving the decision over many years, but the world's turned upside down um, in, in, the last, uh, in the last year or so. Uh, and we're seeing as location strategists, uh, as investment advisors, external factors, particularly the impact of black and gray swan events, increasingly playing a driving role in the investment decision-making. So black swan events are those that are completely unforeseen um, and have a significant global ramifications um, and consequences. Uh, gray swans are events that can be foreseen, but, but whose frequency or probability of happening is usually underestimated by us, by us mere mort mortals. We usually miss them, even though we've, uh, we only see them in, in hindsight, which is 2020. So we're seeing more of these gray and, and black swan factors influence uh, investment location decisions here in Asia and, and globally. Things like nationalism uh, that's leading to trade conflicts, the U.S.-China trade war is really the most influential, but it's not the only trade-related factor influencing investment decisions. We had uh, for three years, right, trying to finish the U.K., trying to finish Brexit negotiations. Uh, we had the renegotiation of AFTA that became the USMCA. Uh, and before that, where there was the U.S. departure from the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Dennis, um, uh, but before you go on, could you turn your uh, webcam on? You, uh, you did not accept it. So uh, we're not seeing oh, if see. you're a white, gray, or black swan at this point. Oh, very good. How about that? Sorry about that. We've got, you. Um, you know, other, other sort of more gray swans, demographic change, uh, the shrinking of global labor forces um, are, are influencing where companies are deciding to invest. And, and that's typically talked about in a developing world setting. 
a developed world setting, I should say, sorry, but it, but it's not just a developed world issue. Uh, in Thailand, where, where John and I call a call home, um, has the third, the, the, the labor force or population that's aging the third fastest in the world. And that's gonna impact where companies make decisions. We've got, uh, in, from the manufacturing supply chain perspective, natural disasters are, are usually the ones that you see in the press the most. Um, and the one that comes to mind that kind of started the whole conversation about manufacturing supply chains and de-risking them was the, the tsunami that took place in, in Japan about over 10 years ago that precipitated the Fukushima nuclear disaster. That affected a few companies, but it wasn't until uh, in supply chains, but it wasn't really until 2011 here in Thailand when we had a major flood that shut down 50% of the world's hard disk drive industry that you had knock-on effects in the entire global computer industry when companies really started to think, you know, where should we, we need to put uh, less of our eggs in, in particular baskets in, in, in the world. And now we've got the COVID pandemic adding insult to injury to the US-China trade war that's really bringing these types of black swan and or natu natural disaster uh, impacts to four. There's also technological change, things like big data and AI, robotics and automation that are impacting uh, location event decisions in really unforeseen ways. And we've got things like climate change and concern about sustainability that we're seeing even companies that are investing in Asia, which hadn't been a major issue for them, uh, changing the way they fundamentally evaluate uh, and, and create value for their stakeholders and their business relationships uh, and where those investments should be placed uh, in order to maximize sustainability. You know, gone are the days, uh, and, and we, we hear talk about it now, but it's really been a discussion that's been happening over the last 10 years. There's just a lot more emphasis on it now. Um, gone are the days when you can have several world scale plants uh, that could be just that be, could, could be considered to, to supply global demand. Uh, if there's scale effects in having large, several large plants globally, but any more, the, those scale benefits are being balanced against the risks of concentration of, of single plants or, or plants located in one geographic region. We're going to see, uh, you know, through we've seen and we're going to see much more risk analysis and scenario analysis take a a more prominent role in the site selection decision, uh, looking at political risk, natural disaster risk, but also regulatory trade, other supply chain uh, re resilience uh, issues, pandemic risk, and, and more. Um, from a from a soft perspective, companies that are investing in non-manufacturing uh, businesses, we've, we've what you've read in the press, we've actually seen our clients come back to us and talk about how they're going to adapt to or will companies that have adapted to having a virtual labor force, how is that going to impact them over the long term? And we've got companies that are saying, hey, it's actually worked to our advantage. Um, and, and how might that impact the investments that we have in shared service centers and, and uh, software development centers? It really does change the investment location decision making when you no longer have to look geographically, but the world is your virtual labor force. So that decision about where to locate makes a, is, a, is a much different question to ask. Coming back to Asia a little bit and, and China, the last 10 years, we've seen companies look at a China plus one strategy. They've got manufacturing operations in China. They're looking at where should they put another one to serve regional markets or, or East Asian markets, but we're seeing that accelerated even more with them saying, okay, we need to be in China for China. Typically, the companies that are focused on the China markets, as Dwight alluded to, are quite profitable, but we also need other ones. And Southeast Asia is, is uh, seeing a tremendous demand for uh, investment to supply East Asian markets, to supply global markets, and to also access the, the huge Southeast Asian market. We're also seeing a lot of interest in India, and I'm, my our colleague Karan is going to talk about just, just now, but we've seen a lot of regionalization of supply chains uh, over the last 10 years. It's not really a new phenomenon, but the the risk that the, these risk black swan events, the gray swan events, the risks of inherent in uh, these trade and regulatory changes are really going to accelerate companies looking at uh, how they can restructure their supply chains uh, in these in this new world order. 
So I'm going to, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karan and he can talk a little bit about uh, opportunities and impacts in India. Thanks, Dennis. Um, excellent, excellent, interesting information. Hi, my name is Karan and I run a firm called Technova, which has essentially been helping international companies establish themselves in India for 36 years now. Um, India has had its fair share of problems and essentially the COVID outbreak recently has been very challenging for the country. The number of cases in India crossed the 100,000 mark just this week, despite a strict nationwide lockdown that's been in place for the last two months. Um, with its huge population and limited healthcare system, it'll take some time for the country to actually regain some form of normality. China, on the other hand, has done better, much, much better in containing the virus spread. Most of the country is almost back to pre-COVID days operationally, from what I understand. Yet, it's now widely recognized that there's a very strong need to have alternatives in place for your business um, to make it less reliant on any one country or economy. Having your business operations in India, Southeast Asia, or any other countries beyond China, it's not just advisable today. I, I believe it's becoming a bit of a necessity. I'm going to just cover um, three simple points about India. The first, essentially, in terms of the actual um, sizing of the market, India, as you might already know, has a population of 1.35 mil, uh, billion people, out of which approximately 450 million people live in urban regions, primarily metros and tier one cities, essentially making India one of the world's largest orbit urbanized populations. English is commonly understood and spoken across the country, and the average age of the population is uh, quite low, it's 29 years old. In my opinion, this makes India a huge target for domestic consumption. And as the per capita income rises in the country, the growing domestic demand coupled with the abundantly available cheap skilled labor makes India an attractive destination for local manufacturing that's not only going to be able to cater to the domestic demand, but also be highly competitive from an export standpoint. There's actually been a lot of changes in India since 2014, ever since the Modi government came into place. Um, between then and now, um, India has moved up 79 places in the World Bank's ease of doing business rankings, moving from number 142 down to number 63 today. This has essentially happened due to a series of reforms implemented in the country. The system is today much more efficient. It's, uh, it's faster uh, when it comes to business essentials like forming companies, attaining instruction permits, um, cross-border trading, the government's goal is actually to continue reforming the country further and to essentially be able to list um, within the top 50 countries that are easy to do business in. Since 2010, India's um, had a trade agreement with ASEAN countries to promote trade and minimize tariffs for more than 90% of products uh, being traded between these regions. Adding to this, the Indian government has uh, well-established incentives that it offers to export-oriented companies in the form of duty credits that can actually be used to offset import duties and other excise duties. This actually makes India a viable export hub in addition to the domestic demands uh, that need to be serviced. Recently, in September 2019, the Indian government announced significant changes um, to their corporate tax structures, effectively reducing the rate um, from 30% to 22% for companies that are registered in India and from 25% down to 15% for new manufacturing operations that are setting up in the country. This was then followed very recently, just last month, by the withdrawal of uh, the dividend distribution tax. Um, this is something that um, had been in place for, for decades, where um, almost a 20% tax was uh, previously borne by the dividend payer. So the company paying out the dividend had to spend, had to, had to uh, bear a 20% tax which has now been transferred and is taxable now in the hands of the receiver as per their respective jurisdictions. So these two measures have been implemented specifically keeping foreign investors in mind to correct the multi-layered taxation system of the past that made India quite unappealing. These two changes now, in my opinion, make India a very attractive destination for new manufacturing, given the low rate of taxes and the ease in repatriating surpluses in the form of dividends. Uh, we've been asked, uh, hundreds of times in terms of uh, the standard questions that we get asked by our clients is how easy it is to it is to actually take your profits out of the country. I must admit, um, with the new changes in, in, in tax laws, it's significantly easier now. In more recent times, India has also been quite vocal and active at a state level to attract foreign investments into the country. 
from creating and making um, large industrial land banks available, uh, fast tracking uh, clearances, relaxing labor norms. Um, various Indian states are working hard towards making India more available and suitable for international companies. Despite all of this, I, I, I mean, there's honestly, there's always a right and a wrong way to look at things. I want to share with you some of my experiences on the very minimalistic things that one needs to think about or rather the right way to look at India. There's no doubts that India can be very challenging and daunting to do business in. Um, I often say that despite India being perceived as a difficult country, there is a method to the madness. Um, it's important to do the homework first. It's very important to understand the market at a ground level by speaking to your customers directly and understand how your competition is operating. One of the biggest challenges that we, we face all the time, or rather a lot of our clients uh, face all the time is essentially when they're dealing with local partners who just don't seem to have the ability to say no to anything. Everything seems to be possible and everything seems to be doable, which is just wrong, it, it's not true. It's essential in our opinion to gain a deep understanding of your potential partner before signing up with them. And you'd be surprised as to the number of companies that we worked with who essentially have gotten it wrong the first time because they've relied on a, a partner who, um, well, for all practical purposes, has been very convincing about their abilities, which they didn't have. Indian customers are also interesting. And the Indian customers are such that they will buy your product, despite the product being a bit more expensive than the local alternative, but they're unlikely to buy products that are twice or thrice the price of local products. So it's very essential. Um, to consider this uh, when you when you talk about exporting into the market, for example, it's very essential to build a relationship with your customers and they actually do need to see you being present directly and locally to give them much more confidence in your commitment to them in the country. This can only happen if you localize in the country and not really by trying to remotely manage and drive sales there. When you do look into India beyond skin deep, you will find a hungry and young country which is filled with talent, uh, with people eager to prove themselves. India is known as a country that's very price conscious. I say um, another way to look at this is that India is a country where the workforce um, is just so used to adopting low cost manufacturing techniques that eventually when the people, the people who will work for you will almost always have a very frugal approach towards business and they won't be afraid to roll up their sleeves to deliver results that are um, sustainable, high quality, and most importantly, competitively priced. Thank you for listening. Um, I'd like to hand this over now to Bob Hess, who will share his experiences and views on nearshoring back to the West. Good afternoon, evening, or where everybody is in the world. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk about three components. So lots of qualitative discussion, a lot of trends um, have been discussed uh, exhaustively in the last few months. My colleagues did a great job at framing out these drivers and these perspectives. Many are qualitative and quantitative. What I'd like to do today is to go over the merits of the uh, nearshoring and reshoring. Of course, and I'm gonna be talking about going west. And West could be obviously Canada, the US, and Latin America, and also and parts of Europe and Central and Eastern Europe. So the geography of things, reshoring and nearshoring, backshoring, many different contexts. It's an important thing to understand is what is that context in sizing the prize? And I'll talk about that. And the second thing is I'll be talking about frameworks. Uh, so how do you actually go into the boardroom and interest the board, the stakeholders, your clients, your customers, suppliers, that you should go through some sort of change like this, then of course the decision-making process. So maybe it is time to go home or closer to home. So what are the merits of that? Um, as Dennis said, the China plus one strategy, these decisions are more about expansions, like the N1, N1, N plus one situation, rather than a relocation. They're also about a product line, changing customer patterns, there's a lot of different drivers and objectives. But to size the prize, um, I think it's really important in terms of jobs. That's what's in the news right now. There's 90 million manufacturing jobs in China and 13 million in the United States, 4 million in Canada, similar amount of Mexico, maybe 13 to 15 million. A lot of that's agriculture. So if you just take 90 million jobs and say, what could be reshored or backshored? Any, let's say one to 3%, it's not 10% or 15% folks. It's one to maybe one to 3%, do the math. 1%, if I, if I do my math correct, that's 900,000, 3%, 2.7 million. So sizing the prize here is a million 
the 3 million jobs at stake that could be reshored or backshored. That's a lot of jobs relative to the size of the US or Canadian or Mexico markets. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, and then the second thing is on more on the distribution side, Dwight talked about that and others about regionalization and of uh, supply chain and distribution and uh, the whole supply chain. Well, if you look at the concept of just in time versus just in case, just in time might mean you can have a plant in Mexico supply US or even a plant in China and supply the US, depending on the speed of, uh, of the actual supply chain, getting things to the facility. Just in case right now is huge, right? PPE, being closer to the customer, immediate supply. If you just changed 5% stock, safety stock, of all the distribution space just in the United States, that would require almost another 1 billion square feet of distribution space. So that's what everybody's looking at, sizing the price in terms of those jobs in that space. And actually the developers, the supply side in the Americas, they're preparing for this. They're looking REITs, developers, they're looking at actually investing dollars in this supply side. So that's real. So where's the demand? So the demand is, is right now is the key thing. So the second point, so that's Mexico, Eastern Europe, reshoring back to home. So where will that demand be? How are you gonna look at it? There's frameworks. All these shorings, I mean, what's the practicality of this? There's lots of options and variables. So let's talk about all these qualitative and quantitative variables. And a lot of times when companies look at these decisions, there's probably 40 or 50 different variables. Uh, obviously there's the cost side, labor, transportation, inventory. You can quantify everything that uh, my colleagues talked about. You can quantify risk. Uh, you can quantify time and transit. You can even you know, quantify issues of, I'll call it, um, business climates or you know clusters and ecosystems uh obviously duplicating a supply chain that's a tremendous amount of risk and investment um and then it, uh so there's lots of different variables to look at so basically you have to look at that as an algorithm the qualitative and the quantitative side risk intangibles and intangibles might be the immediate market need um that's got to be supplied so and by the way you don't have to enter into the reshoring nearshoring concept with a new facility and new capital that's always difficult to tell somebody at the board i have to spend 10 million to secure a hundred million dollar market because cash flow is really important other ways you look at reshoring and nearshoring are things like 3pls or m a or actually using you know, contract manufacturers, just like we used to do in the Americas, in China initially, before it became wholly owned investments, whoopies, et cetera. So there's different ways to look at that reshoring, backshoring. Um, a couple of good examples on that. Right now, we have a client in-house that did a make versus buy study roughly 10 years ago. The study said that they should actually um, Buy, um, buy and source from China, not continue to make in the uh, United States, they are looking at reversing that strategy because of demand patterns and who their customer base is, which is in the news. So now they're looking at a reversal of that strategy. And that's just like basically a privately held company, small family, but that's how they're going to survive is to look at this change and disruption and look at their scenarios and alternatives into a single or double warehouse environment here and a 3PL not the cost of doing it themselves in the US. On the manufacturing side, you've all seen the TSMC conduct, uh, announcement, the semiconductor in Phoenix, Arizona. That was $12 billion investment. So there's bigger investments potentially. I don't see you see as many as big investments like that, but that's a company that's looking at being in this market and you know making that manufacturing investment where they have to be here in an equity mode. And of course, um, be closer to certain segments here that are gonna need their chips in all different types of forms of products that are developing in post COVID-19 and their current customer base. Servicing it from the US probably look pretty fe feasible right now relative to parts of Asia where the of course the costs are rising and wages are fairly equal, right? Time and transit, it's a light product, you would fly it. But of course that has issues and, and Dwight uh, raised some of those issues. So again, what are the merits? We size the prize. What are the frameworks? Did you have to look at this? And then of course you have to go into the boardroom. And that's basically looking at the feasibility of these decisions. So the feasibility mean looking at all of these, these variables, developing an algorithm, they're all goal driven, again, different goals, right? Um, and then being able to quantify all of these factors. And I guess the key point about decision making is all of these companies that are considering reassuring, nearshoring, by the way, life science is another one. Over 75% of all of our active pharmaceutical ingredients 
that supply domestic markets are in China. That is definitely an industry that will be evaluated very closely. It is right now. And I'm sure what they're doing in the boardroom is doing exactly looking at this algorithm of all these factors, weighting and scoring them, looking at the criteria, running scenarios, what ifs, quantifying the risks, quantifying time in transit, even quantifying um, qualitative issues, uh, the products that are actually being developed. And, uh, and, they're, and they're looking at, and they're going and sitting in meetings now saying, is this feasible? That's the first step. And uh, that's something that all of us here at, on, on the call have talked about offline, about pulling this into a true evaluative framework. There's ways to go about this and to make sure you can go in there and you look at what if, what could be, and does it make sense? So um, that's what's going on right now. It needs to go on and uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the framework of actually how to operationalize this whole reshore and nearshore coming back home. Gentlemen, thank you. That was a lot of information uh, in a very short amount of time that covered the entire globe. And so uh, I'm sure that there are going to be a number of questions. Uh, I've already seen some of them coming up. Uh, I, what I'd like to do, though, is I'd like to start first with just a, a question that I have. I'm, I'm hearing all of you talk about global manufacturing footprints, supply chain change. And I, one of the things is how quickly do you see this occurring? and what's driving that speed of, of change or, or lack of speed of change in, in your particular geographies? Well, I'll start there. Um, okay, go ahead, Bob. Uh, you know, existing production and distribution supply chains are deeply ingrained. Let's take the steel industry. If you're thinking about duplicating a, a capacity or capability somewhere else in the world, first of all, these are very capital intensive decisions because we're talking about manufacturing, right? deeply ingrained supply chain. So right now, do you want to disrupt your, your, your sourcing or try to make it work until you have a more stable time, right? So you can meet the demand patterns. You do, you, it's got to be on the shelf. It's got to be in the hospital. So these are very deeply ingrained, complex decisions, unless it's a line. Maybe Dwight could talk about this. It doesn't have to be, again, a whole facility. It could be a line, an innovation, a technology that's very mobile, right? And you put your toe in the water. So maybe the toe's in the water, or the changes are in place, but not the big, I'll call it, giant relocations of a lot of assets. John, an example would be, uh, overall, our companies have done well, but one of our operations, we're gonna have to shut down. Uh, we were 60 plus percent dependent on a US high technology uh, customer, and uh, they had paid, since July of 2018, 25% import duty. When they got, when they had paid $5 million of import duty, they came to us and said, we just can't keep doing this. And that, and it was a very demanding application for them to do their transfer to a contract manufacturer in another Asian country where it did not have the US import duty. Uh, it was scheduled for an 11 month transfer. We worked with them on that. So, most levels of production that, I mean, you've got the workforce to train, you've got quality issues. Yep. Uh, the 25% import in the U.S. is really a make or break. You know, when it's 5%, 10%, you sort of live with that. So, I, I, I think, again, this has to be very specific. Uh, there are strategic issues we are seeing right now. For example, we are suppliers to uh, Apple and some other large telecom equipment manufacturers they have simply come across and said we need x percent again it depends is it the antenna or something else but 30 percent uh made outside of uh china so uh that they've given time to but it's a general direction that's happening as, as, as things go so uh you got to work with your customer on the flip side i'll tell you on the aerospace side uh, and this decoupling uh, what I would just say, uh, we have Chinese customers that now have to go through enormous uh, paperwork to get approval to buy U.S. aerospace parts. Not for the U.S. DOD, uh, DOD or ITAR re uh, restriction issues, but simply the China government has an informal policy. We don't want them to be reliant uh, like Huawei on, on, on certain U.S. critical components. So. Uh, 
Um, these are all ones, you know, customers are driving things. Kar yeah, Karani. Karani. Oh, sorry. No, so I was just going to say, India, speed, fast or slow? Um, I'd say uh, somewhere in the middle, leaning towards fast. I think the reality is very simple. The challenge for India, and now, okay, we've seen this. It's not just about the COVID situation right now. We've been experiencing this, experiencing this for the last 15 months, ever since the trade war started between US and China. We've actually seen the volume of queries coming to us from American companies looking for alternative sources in India, um, specifically in the automotive sector and industrial applications go through the roof. It's it's doubled. It's beyond doubled. But the reality is, I think the big challenge for us in India is, call it because of the economies of scale, we're not able to match those prices as competitively. Uh, I think consistently across the board, the, the message that I've seen is that the quality of products is at par. It, it can be improved further, but it's not that bad. The reality is India seems to be about 20, 25% more expensive than China. And unless um, Indian entrepreneurs or Indian businesses are able to scale up to that level, matching those price points is, is going to be a bit of a challenge. I think we'll get there, but it's going to take a while. Anas, any any further comments, or should I move on to the next question? Yeah, I mean, I think you've we've seen the, the impacts of some of the things that Dwight was talking about in Southeast Asia. This is kind of the destination of uh, first resort, as it were, for companies that need to move some of that manufacturing capacity outside of China, very close by, uh, kind of culturally similar, easy to uh, a little bit easier to move, and also you can still link into the, to some of the, the China supply chains for really uh, critical components. So we're seeing an avalanche of those kind of products, projects, not only Western companies, but Chinese companies that need to move some of their production out as well. And John, can I just add on to this quickly? Uh, the other factor right now is automation and intelligent automation and lean. So before you move anything or look at any type of reshoring and nearshoring, and uh, uh, all the CFOs and executives want to say, what can we automate? What can we You do that before you actually make these big investments. So that takes a while. You got to study that, evaluate it, and it's not one for one, one for one job from here to somewhere else. So that 55% of a recent survey we did said that companies will accelerate their automation. Very important factor. I, I think that's a very good point, uh, Bob. I, I'm going to go to some questions uh, fr uh, from the audience, and one of those is uh, around the worsening uh, U.S.-China relations and. Uh, I think this is a good good question, Dwight, for, for you, but also Bob and, and Dennis on, on companies that are moving from China. The question was, in terms of reshoring trends, uh, is there are there particular locations that we see this going? And in that question about speed, is it go, is it going to accelerate now uh, with the with the current U.S. China relations? Sure. In this case, John, let me take in my position as chair for the AmCham Manufacturing Group. So I'll take 500 company, U.S. companies there. Uh, the data that we recently collected in March, so it's dated to March, uh, but COVID was already affecting it, was uh, Vietnam was actually perceived at capacity. So surprisingly, it wasn't in the top three, but the top three destinations of U.S. companies in China going to other locations, the U.S. was not. It was a fifth choice, but it was Mexico, Thailand, the Philippines. Number two, in terms of speed, uh, you know, I'm a manufacturing guy, and I think what I want to stress is that it 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 takes time. I mean, to build a new building, you know, you, you, if you go and you go to your spec factories, yeah, there's a few products you can put in there, but in general, you got to design a factory. So you're talking 12 to 24 months uh, if you're in a chip factory at TSMC. I mean, you're looking at a five-year type of scenario. So I would just, uh, what is clear is not, let's not talk about the speed, but the direction. And once you get movement here, it doesn't change. So this is a tectonic event that will change the next decade of where we're going. And so it is going to, as Karen said, to India, it is going to other places uh, but but it's a small percentage of total China manufacturing, but it's significant in the amount. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to ask, uh, there was a, a question that came from the audience uh, about pharmaceutical companies investing in the United States. And the question was actually about uh, some recent announcements about Chinese pharmaceutical companies. And 
I know from some work that our firm has done and, and, and Dennis has looked at and some comments Bob just made, uh, there's a high concentration of, of pharmaceutical, not only in China, but in India. And so the question was, do, do the panel think that you'll see increased Chinese investment, and I'm gonna add Indian, investment into pharma into North America? And also, will you see a, a reshoring of global companies into, into the West? So maybe Dennis, we can start with you. Um, I mean, I think the answer is yes. You certainly see some announcements. The Europeans are announcing, uh, maybe not reshoring, but because so much is concentrated, API manufacturing is concentrated in China. There's not, it's not a lot to be reshored from Western companies, of course. But the European pharmaceutical manufacturers are talking about building API um, capacity in Europe. Um, and there's certainly going to be very similar to the other types of manufacturing offshoring that we see the Chinese doing in Southeast Asia. We'd certainly imagine that happening back to the United States as well, or whichever markets uh, they feel are make the most sense. Yeah, so um, I'll comment on this. This is um, really want, don't want to get into political or regulatory issues, but on this one, you have to, you know, if you've seen recent press announcements about the here in the United States, HSS and DOD granting hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from the administration to make sure surge capacity, um, syringes, um, the whole issue of vaccines are actually manufactured here in the United States. And of course, be tracking them with new technology. So in the short term, uh, John, that is a reality. And uh, there, there's some ramp up going on with that. Uh, it's well advertised in press releases. Long term, it has it has yet to, to to be evaluated because this industry, the life science industry, has been global for decades, right? Uh, where's R and D? Where's production and development? Where's manufacturing? And then, of course, where are the CROs, right? And then, of course, where's the uh, sterile fill finish? So it's it's a whole horizontal integration, and that's all in different countries, and it's worked pretty well. But it is going to move into this whole regionalization of where things need to be closer to the, I guess, call it the customer, COVID nineteen customers very, very seriously. And there, there is this, I love what Dwight said, directionally, that is where it's headed. John, the one caveat is most of those pharmaceuticals, you're talking about a uh, pre about state or enterprises in China. They operate in a different universe, certainly at least a different galaxy than private companies or public traded companies. And their incentives given to them by the Chinese government oftentimes do not go cross border if it's not part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, I think a, a clear analysis would be that if they come to the US, it would not be in the same type of structures and dominance as what they have currently. I, I think the international companies, the Baxters, the other pharmaceuticals are gonna step up to the plate here but China will not give the SOEs the same incentives to invest in the U.S. at this time. Karan, any comment? Yeah, just a small one over here. I think with Indian pharmaceutical giants, uh, we're talking about companies um, who are very strong API manufacturers as well as generic product manufacturers. Um, I don't necessarily see Indian companies moving to uh, manufacturing products in the U.S. I definitely see an influx of companies who are setting up their regional offices in the U.S. from a sales perspective. CIPLA, Sun, uh, Dr. Reddy's, Sun Pharma, some examples of companies that have now been able to establish a, well, um, a fairly deep distribution network for their products in the U.S. That's the extent of what I see coming from the Indian pharmaceutical sector. Thanks. Thanks, Karan. We have a very interesting question that came up, and it was a question that was focused on China, but has a, has a, a, a broader base. The question was, has the U.S. outsourcing strategy failed? And are we going to see a major strategic change where the United States is no longer outsourcing to the rest of the world and where they're trying to minimize and localize that supply chain. And that could be said for, for any developed economy. John, I, you know, again, I don't really understand that question in terms of did the US federal government have an outsourcing strategy 
I think it was business that looked at markets, looked at total cost analysis, looked at supply chain, and it was a natural, uh, looked at incentives that were given by governments. Uh, uh, as an example, so our equity holdings in 2007, I think we had 12. My average tax rate was 5.5% income tax rate. I, I was going through the five and 10 year incentives that were being given. Right now it's 25% on everything with two exceptions where I'm at 15% because of certain high tech status. But so that's business. I, 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 I think business goes to where it, 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 it needs to go. And, and, and uh, I, so I, I don't think it's a, it's a government decision so much um uh, as as much as business has to be attracted and and karen talked about so i mean look at this dividend thing is a massive issue uh in india our company lives on dividends and you know china's got a 10 percent withholding but fortunately it's fully credible against u.s taxes so so far so you know that's been a a, a way uh, we you know that 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 money we live on uh, so just to, some quick comments yeah Karan will like this. So Karan sat down last year with a healthcare company from India who said they had to be in the United States because they developed a product. Uh, the R&D was fantastic in India, and now they needed markets. It's like Dwight yeah. said, it's about market access and securing customers uh, and, and the cost, you know. Um, and of course, um, there's in for in. I mean, the markets are developing all across the world. So 3M is not going to relocate a plant from China to the United States. They have an in for in strategy. They have to be in market for that market, just like they're in the United States. Again, there could be lines or carve outs. And of course, there could be influencers that we're hearing in the news that would impact some of these industries. But I agree with the white. It's about business and markets, maybe even getting around tax and regulatory anti-dumping laws where you had to put a steel plant in the United States because you couldn't ship steel in. So you have to manufacture here. So I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a failure, it's business, and but there's some strong influencers coming out there that are being impacted by COVID-19. Yeah, and we've seen that before, right, Bob? I mean, in, in the New North America, there was the cycle of over a decade, you had all the Japanese transplant automotive manufacturers moving there. Right. Bit of a, regu bit of a regulatory push on that one. That's uh, right. And there was massive supply chain shifts. So we, there's all different kinds of factors that are gonna impact that. Yeah. John? John yeah, you know, so let's talk about a couple of our startups. So these are green, these were green fields in China, uh, in the telecom area. So we had Samsung in the auto parts, we had General Motors. They would give us one to four year contracts and they would say, okay, you can supply from your European US current base for the first year at this price. Day 366, you've got to have a factory up and running in China we'll buy it at x and y price and if you're not up and running we'll keep buying from the us but now you've got to show a 15 percent decrease in pricing so well so those type of incentives on the reverse side if if you have some of these major pharmaceuticals j and j or others that come to us and say okay we need you to be in the us and we'll give you this sort of advance uh purchase kind these are typically not 20 page contracts but are typically three pages but more than just an MOU, a memorandum of understanding, but not a fixed contract and saying, okay, we'll buy, as long as your price quality delivery meet these, we'll buy minimum of Y amount. If we see more of those contracts today, I don't have any of that happening. Um, uh, so it just uh, as a, so getting back to the US, I, I do have people saying you gotta be out of China, but not people saying you gotta be in the US. So for us, the decisions to do a China plus one strategy, the, the plus one is not the U.S. requirement. It's simply be, be outside of China to avoid the U.S. import duty. Thanks, thanks, Dwight. Um, I'm, we've got just a couple minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up on a question. Uh, all the business persons, uh, all of the consumers that are listening to this, everybody wants to know about the economies. And you know, wh where is your economy heading post COVID? Okay, and then what does that mean, do you think, for the global economy? And I'm just going to go kind of right down the line. And, and Bob, you know, you're, we're going to talk about the West, but North America. What, what, is, what does COVID mean for the economy, and, and where is it going to be in three years? Well, we're out of the shock phase, and now we're in recovery. And, uh, and it's going to be kind of a 
clunky, jerky, interesting recovery. Uh, everybody's interested in recovering quickly, but this balance of safety and getting back to work, um, there's, there was never any playbook. There were no playbooks. So everybody's developing their own playbooks right now, and it differs by asset type, industry, geographies across the country. So uh, for me, the, the, the economy has a strong correlation in terms of how we communicate work across all of those government and public and private sectors. By the way, public-private sector partnership for me is a huge correlation to how quickly we recover, how they work together, those sectors. Just not the government, just not the private sector. Uh, and, you know, time will tell. It's really early to be uh, uh, the mighty Karnak here and project things. But, uh, you know, the concept of V versus U versus a hockey stick or, uh, or a swoosh in general, uh, I'm not an economist, but uh, even even our own leaders in our own company are, are thinking more like a swoosh or a hockey stick. And uh, and that's realistic because it's, it's really kind of hard to you know, kind of move from now to next in, in just weeks. But we hope it will. And there's certain sectors that are already doing well. Look at Walmarts and the Targets. Holy cows. They're exploding, right? So there's different set. You got to know where to point the rifle in the economy, John. And, and so, thank you, Bob. So if the world's number one economy, it's not very clear how long that recovery is going to take. Dwight, the world's number two economy, does that, that does it get pulled down by number one or does it recover and, and blossom? Well, the, the hope, let's go back to third quarter of 2019 and before it was, we want the Chinese consumers, the 400 million middle class people to be up and buying and that was driving, you know, uh, the last five years, it was driving like 40 to 50 to 60% of the world's growth. China was growing to 6% plus six, to, you know, uh, we had 25 years of, of six plus percent growth uh, with one slight tick in 1997. Um, we, I don't know, Bob, I don't know, John. So, so when we go from the, the, the economy that drove domestic demand and, and growth to the one that could, Karan, yeah, you know what? Uh, interesting question. Okay, I think as far as the COVID situation and India is concerned, India um, is is struggling to cope with it right now. I think the reality is, as as uh, Bob mentioned over here, none of the governments, not at the state level or at the central level, really know what to do and how to do it. But uh, that's sort of something that I've been seeing across multiple countries around the world. I think it's going to be um, a very challenging situation for India the next six to twelve months. Um, and I think, quite honestly speaking, a lot of people that I speak to who are industrialists in India, the government's given the go-ahead, um, effective last week, business is back on despite um, despite the health risks. Uh, the government's basically telling the people, get back to work. So I think there is, the economy has been self-reliant, more entrepreneurs have been reliant on themselves more than the government for their business. And I think they're getting back into gear. So I think there is going to be a recovery despite the health uh, fallouts. And, and so, Dennis, the average economic growth rate of the 10 ASEAN nations has been about 5% for more than two decades. So while, you know, China was making all the news, ASEAN kept growing. Post-COVID, does it continue? Post-COVID, it's going to depend on Dwight, Dwight and Bob's predictions because the Southeast Asian markets are so heavily trade-weighted. trade, trade uh, weighted. Thailand's probably the heaviest, maybe 75% of, of GDP is based on trade. Uh, it's re and the big markets are Europe, North America, and, well, and then now, and more recently, China. So the faster, and China being the closest, the faster China can recover, the faster that's going to pull up Southeast Asia. Um, and it's, so it's going to it's gonna be a long slog. Well, gentlemen, thank you. I know we covered a, a, a very broad range of, of topics. Uh, related to the uh, the global manufacturing distribution and supply chain. Uh, there were over 70 attendees tonight. Uh, for the attendees that are still there, uh, you have the emails, you have the contacts of, of all four of these gentlemen. I'm sure they're uh, very willing to, uh, to answer additional questions. There's a few questions I didn't get to. And uh, we have recorded this uh, and uh, we are happy to send out uh, the PowerPoint. So everyone, thank you. It was a pleasure and uh, have a wonderful evening, morning, day, regardless of where you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.